Okay, so the goal for this lesson will be to review um, the great heresies in the early church in the first millennia and also to um, focus on the councils, uh, the great church councils, which uh, taught orthodox, that is correct doctrine, uh, true teaching about the gospel. Um, so much of this will be a review for those of you who remember the unit that we did on the ecumenical councils and the years that they occurred and what they taught. Um, you're going to be expected to review and match um, the heresies with basically what they taught and how the church actually corrected those heresies and promoted correct teaching, right belief. So one uh, mnemonic device that you can use to help remember uh, is again like a, a letter C with hair on it. It's kind of a, a funny uh, way to remember the name Harry C. If you're not familiar with that term, heresy again means that you deny some uh, part of the Christian faith, uh, some truth of the Christian faith. So perhaps a person is baptized, but then they go their own way. They believe that they're correct and they don't trust the church to teach the right thing. So it's one thing to ask a question and want to know the truth and to try to better understand it. Uh, it's another thing to like insist that one is right and everyone else is wrong, uh, especially the church that Jesus established in order to help guide us in the right direction. So, so many of the the heretics that we're going to talk about are people who had that kind of like prideful disposition. Okay, so now we're going to go through and you're going to take notes on the councils. If you need to pause the video at any time in order to slow down and, and uh, take down any information, feel free to do so. Okay, the councils of the early church and the heresies that they corrected. Okay, the first council of Nicaea, again, that occurred um, after Christianity was legalized in 313. Remember Constantine, uh, the Edict of Milan, uh, made many different religions uh, tolerable in the Roman Empire. Before that, they had been persecuted, so that entire unit on the martyrs of the early church and how the Roman emperors at various times persecuted the church and tried to destroy it, the last one being Diocletian. Um, but then right afterwards, Constantine paved the way so that um, the church could be free of those types of external persecutions. And now the church was free um, to be able to express itself more publicly. And in, in this case, there was also an internal problem at the time of Constantine's reign. Um, there were some people who were teaching that Jesus wasn't really completely equal to God the Father. Remember, the heresy was known as Arianism. Arius was a, a priest, an Egyptian priest in Alexandria, Egypt, and he taught that Jesus was basically of a similar nature or substance to the Father, kind of uh, the first great creature, better than the angels, better than anything else that came after that God created, uh, almost like a, a super demigod or super angel that God created before anything else, but still not equal to the Father. He's not co-eternal. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's limited. He's different from the Father. Of course, Orthodox teaching, the bishops of the Council of Nicaea came up with the Nicene Creed, and the Orthodox teaching was that the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, Jesus, is true God, okay? The same substance that is nature as God the Father, and Saint Athanasius was the hero of that council. He, uh, defended uh, the divine nature of Christ, so that Christ is indeed um, a divine person who became human in order to save our souls. If he's not divine, then he can't do that, and therefore the whole Christian faith is useless if, if Jesus is not God. So in the Nicene Creed, homo usios, same substance. In English, we have a word that comes from Latin that's similar to this Greek term that means same substance, and you might recognize that from the Nicene Creed that's said at Mass on Sundays and special holy days. Consubstantial means basically the same thing as homoousius. Jesus is one in being. He has the same nature as the Father and the Spirit. So three divine persons, not in one person, but in one divine nature. They all possess the same divine nature. So a closer look at the creeds, okay, the Apostles' Creed, which is much shorter, perhaps came first as a, an early baptismal creed. It's Trinitarian. We speak of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we do briefly say that we believe in Jesus Christ, His, meaning the Father's only Son, our Lord. Okay, now as Christians that have been taught the faith, we know what that means, but at the time, if in the world, there were some people that were not evangelized or who were being led along the wrong path. They needed clarification. So basically, the Council of Nicaea, again, took uh, the Nicene Creed and expanded upon that. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. And this is an important part. He's God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. In other words, what is eternal begets also someone who is eternal, not created like Arius said, but eternally begotten, consubstantial, the same nature with the Father. Through him, Jesus, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. So this clarifies for anyone in the world at the time who would have doubted that Jesus is God, that Jesus truly is God. Okay, the second council. The first council of Constantinople occurred in the same century as Nicaea, towards the end in 381 AD, around the time of Theodosius, who was the first emperor, remember, to uh, make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. In this case, the heresy at the time was an offshoot of Arianism, Macedonianism. Basically, they taught that the Holy Spirit is a creature similar to God, but not equal to God. So again, Orthodox teaching, the Holy Spirit is God. And we say in the Creed, based on the teachings of many of the early saints, like St. Basil the Great, uh, that the Holy Spirit with the Father and Son is adored and glorified. So if we look back at our creed down here, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit in the Apostles' Creed, but in the Nicene Creed we expand it. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Already we've identified that the Holy Spirit is God, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Originally in the Nicene Creed it had said, who proceeds from the Father, Okay, but it's not heresy to say that he also proceeds from the Son, but that's for a later unit. Okay, Who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. So only God is adorable, right? Okay, Only God deserves worship. Holy Spirit is adored. That means he's God. He's spoken through the prophets. Our third council, remember the Council of Ephesus, 431. This heresy was Nestorianism. Uh, Nestorius, sometimes he's actually defended by historians. They say that he wasn't really the one that promoted the heresy, but it was other men at the time. Regardless of whether that's true or not, uh, the heresy is still known uh, by this bishop's name. Nestorius was the bishop of Constantinople, and uh, he taught that Christ is only a human being, uh, that the divine Son of God, in a sense, adopted or chose Jesus, the Son of Mary, to work with him and through him, uh, but that we're talking about basically in his mind two persons working together and that's not the orthodox teaching he opposed mary being called the mother of god theotokos you guys know that term mary is called the mother of jesus in the scriptures she's the mother of christ all of those are perfectly acceptable titles for her but what he meant and others like him meant was that when we call mary christokos christ bearer instead of theotokos god bearer is that christ was just a human guy that the divine son worked through correct teaching okay orthodox teaching is that jesus christ is one not two one divine person with two natures human and divine if you notice the the coals over here they're glowing they're burning embers and they have fire within them and sometimes when you look at a hot ember a coal you know you can have one piece of coal one ember that in a sense has two natures there's the coalness okay we can think of that as like the humanity of jesus then the fire within it is like the divinity. It, it, they're complete and together. Uh, they're inseparable from each other. Uh, so too with Jesus in his incarnation. When the word took flesh, divine and human were perfectly united in harmony with one another, those two natures. But it was still just one divine person who had assumed that human nature. So it's right to call her Theotokos, God-bearer or mother of God. Mary is not a goddess. She didn't create his divinity. She didn't even create his human spirit. But because the person that she gave birth to really was God, we can say appropriately that she's the mother of God. The feast day for Mary, mother of God. In the east, it's on December 26th. In the west, it's January 1st. Uh, those are both holidays within the Christmas season. And icons at the time in the early church started becoming teaching tools for people, and they still are today. So here we have an icon of Theotokos, of Mary, mother of God, and the infant Christ. And the Greek letters up here, Mater Theos. Uh, that's those are initials for that. Um, they teach us that Mary truly is the God bearer, the mother of God. Okay, another council, the Council of Chalcedon in 451, same century as Ephesus. Okay, one important thing to note about this council, monophysitists, mono meaning one and physis meaning nature, uh, they basically taught that at some point, even if Jesus was conceived and born as a human being, uh, that 
Gradually, his divinity took over and absorbed and changed that humanity to where Jesus is mostly or only divine. So kind of like if you would think of like a drop of water going into a puddle or a pond or an ocean, uh, eventually whatever is distinct about that drop gets absorbed and changed into the nature of the wider body of water. That's not orthodox teaching, of course. We know that as Christians, we believe that Jesus is fully human, fully divine. He's not 90-10, 80-20, however you would divide that. Um, Jesus is one divine person with two natures, but there's no uh, limiting of the divine nature by the human, and there's no overwhelming of the human nature by the divine. Okay, The Tome of Leo, which is a letter that Pope Leo the Great wrote and sent to the council, explaining the hypostatic union, and this affirms the scriptures when Jesus often refers to himself as son of God and son of man, fully divine, fully human. Quickly on some of these councils, we're just going to go over them simply. The Second Council of Constantinople, which occurred in the 6th century in 553, the Orthodox teaching, reaffirmed basically any church teaching on the Trinity, that there are three divine persons in one divine nature, and the Incarnation, Jesus being one divine person, the second divine person of the Holy Trinity, who became incarnate of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, and thus was fully divine, fully human, and we often see artwork, um, abstract artwork that shows us the relationship between the persons of the Trinity. The third Council of Constantinople in the year 680 AD, the heresy that was taught, basically it was an offshoot of monophysitism, which taught that Jesus was only divine. Monotheolatism uh, taught that Jesus had one will. In other words, uh, we all have human freedom, right? We all have free will, and our our heart is one way of saying that we have that freedom, that freedom to choose between good and evil, and to choose to follow God. So if Jesus really was human, then that means he had a human will, he had a human heart, as represented by the sacred heart here. Uh, that heart was always attuned to the divine will. In other words, the will that he possessed with the Father, the divine will, was distinct from the human will of Jesus. But Jesus's human will was always ordered towards doing the divine will. Okay, the last council we're going to take a look at is the Second Council of Nicaea in the 8th century. At one time, people actually took an aversion to these sacred works of art, and they started committing sacrilege against them. There would actually be people who would go into churches. This was happening primarily in the Byzantine Empire. And they would go in there, and they would destroy icons of the Blessed Virgin Mary or any saint or Christ. They would take, and they would destroy it. They thought it was idolatry to have such images, and it's believed one theory is that the emperor at the time tolerated it because they were dealing with Islamic forces who also had a great aversion to any kind of pictorial image of a prophet like Muhammad uh, or even Jesus. Any Anything that was depicted visually, they thought that that was blasphemy. So, And it became known as the iconoclastic or iconoclasm heresy. In other words, icon meaning image, clasm meaning breaker, image breakers. They would consider veneration of saints, images, and relics as idolatrous. So they would go around like invading and vandalizing and destroying churches. So the Orthodox teaching, worship is due to God alone. Remember, God, only God is adorable. But we can venerate saints, relics, and sacred images. Okay, Just like the Jews had uh, devotion to many of the Old Testament saints like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, we see devotion to relics in the scriptures. There's the shadow of St. Peter, which heals people. There's, there's the apron and napkin of St. Paul that heals people. Even going back to the Old Testament, the bones of uh, Joseph are venerated. No one is worshiping uh, any of these holy people. It's a way of honoring them, just like, of course, we would have a picture of our family on the wall at home or a, a statue of a great leader. We're not bowing down and worshiping these people. We're not adoring them. We're just honoring them for who they are. And when we honor the saints, we're honoring what God has done through them. And scripture itself says Jesus is the visible icon of the invisible God. Okay, image. Jesus is the visible image of God in the world, and he really is God. So God himself made himself an icon, and that's why, in a sense, we can also make an icon of Christ, because Christ is that visible image of God. Okay, a few terms, lastly, to go over what they discussed at the council. These are terms that go back to Greek and also have been translated over the ages into various languages like Latin. But dulia, okay, the honor that we give to the saints. Okay, these are distinctions. Uh, hyperdulia, special honor that we give to Mary, the mother of God, because of her special role as queen of the communion of saints. Um, all, both of those are distinct from 
latria, which is adoration, what we would think of as what we only are required to give to God. Worship given only to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we honor an icon um, or an altar or any sacred image, a Bible, a rosary, anything like that, we're giving dulia to the object to pass over that honor to the person whom it represents. Uh, when we worship God, though, we would say we only worship, of course, God in the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist. Uh, we worship God in spirit. And even images of God, like an icon of Christ, we do adore Christ, but we're not worshiping the image of Christ. The image reminds us that Jesus really did take flesh. He was visible. He continues to be visible through the sacraments, and that our adoration is due to God through him. 